That's what you join with me in standing this morning. So you read our text, our scriptures, and you say, why do we stand? But other churches, they don't stand, and that's okay for them. But for us, it's important, for me, it's important that we show our respect for the holy. Not only these words holy, not only these words proven, but these words are living. And so we take our time to respect them. Hebrews chapter 13, verses 1 through 6 this morning. Hebrews 13, 1 through 6 says this. says, let brotherly love continue. Do not forget to entertain strangers, for by doing so, some have unwittingly entertained angels. Remember the prisoners as if chained with them. Those who are mistreated, since you yourselves are in the body also. Marriage is honorable among all. And the bed undefiled, but fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have, for he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Verse 6, so we may boldly Say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Thank you. You may be seated this morning. Three weeks from today, May 15th, we're going to be beginning, we are beginning a new series. Uh, That new series is going to be titled Investigating Christianity. And there's a lot of people in our world today that are trying to disprove God, to disprove the Bible, to disprove the Savior, Jesus Christ. And so we're going to take a few weeks and focus on the evidence, focus on the truth that serves as a foundation of Christianity. And you don't want to miss it. So once again, I invite you to join us starting May 15th as we're going to be talking all about investigating Christianity. But today, this morning, is week 18. Week 18 of our study through the book of Hebrews. And to me... By no means is that depressing. I've loved every minute. I hope you have as well. Loved every minute going through this book, through this series. Over and over again, we have seen the superiority of Jesus Christ. Over and over again, we've seen the fact, the truth, that Jesus is greater. And this morning, we enter the last chapter of this great book, Hebrews chapter 13. And this chapter, first chapter 13, as well as the last one, chapter 12, to me, just to give you... A few thoughts here. To me, it seems like someone who's trying to have a two-hour phone conversation, but your battery's dying. How many times have you started a conversation, and maybe it's just me and Michelle who do this, maybe you don't, and you say, listen, you always inter- the first thing you do is you're interrupting someone. Listen, before you get started, my phone's about to die, so I have to tell you this. Anybody ever? Am I the only one who's done this? I do. Okay, yeah, a lot of hands. There you go. So listen, don't forget, honey, listen, don't forget, get milk. Don't forget, I'm going to be home late. So you're almost just jumping in, you're like cutting somebody off before you even get started. My phone's about to die, please, listen. And that's kind of how I feel these last two chapters are. The author here, he's hurried, he's in a rush, he's all over the map. In our passage last week, if you here last week, it was the same exact way. We kind of caught pieces from all different angles. He was saying things like, You need to be peaceful. Oh, by the way, you need to be holy. Oh, and don't forget to guard against bitterness. Oh, and if I don't forget, let me remind you that no one, please make sure no one is sexually immoral. Well, today, as I just read, it's built the same way. Things like, you better love each other. Oh, and by the way, don't forget to be hospitable. Oh, and please, you need to protect marriage. Oh, and don't forget, don't love money. See, it's kind of, all over the place this morning. This kind of reminds me of how someone would be if they were passing away. And they they have just the last few words of wisdom to give to their kids, to their family. If it was me, I'd I'd be like, Leah, listen. Come here, I don't have much time. All boys are evil, Leah. You know, all boys are evil. And then Luke, come here, listen. Listen, blondes, they're very dangerous, right? The blondes are dangerous. Here's her mother, you know. She's not here today, so I could be in, you know. Hopefully, she, yeah, thank Yeah, I know, I know. So it's like you're giving some final thoughts, some final words of wisdom, some final advice. Nothing is really planned in those moments, and that's what I feel like it, we're seeing here at the end of Hebrews. And this morning, it's once again that rapid fire is found in our text. 
throughout chapter 12, throughout chapter 13, we're seeing the authors giving us strategic duties, strategic lifestyles that we are called to live out. Duties that are critical, not only for my life, for my edification, my spiritual life, but also for how we as a family, we as a church can grow spiritually. And this morning, like you see, like you heard, there's so many things that we can pull from this passage. But I like to just take three and just spend some time focusing on three ways that we can demonstrate, three ways we can live out our lives as Christian men, Christian women. It begins in the first verse. Number one is found in the first verse where it says that we are to love our Christian brothers. We are to love our Christian sisters. The passage that I read says, let the love of the brethren continue. That gives you and I instantly, we have a responsibility. We are to have a responsibility to love one another. We are co-heirs, we are brothers and sisters. There's an obligation for us to be responsible for each other as we journey through life together. And you may say, and I may say, well, I'm sure he knows what he's doing, right? She's okay. She, she knows what she's doing. I don't want to interfere. We say things like, that, that's not my place to say anything. But let me encourage you today, that is your place. In brotherly love, in a loving manner, that is your place. Fact out, that is biblical. This love principle, this love is action, is found throughout the Bible, just four it's found in Romans 13, 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 4, 1 John 4, 1 Corinthians 13. That's just named a few real fast. There's many more. I just said it fast. Don't write it down, of course. The truth of Christian love is so crystal clear. And the author, he doesn't want to make you have to guess. He doesn't want to make you have to say, well, how? That's great. I'm to love others. Well, how do I do that? And he even supplies us with the answer. For the next few verses, he gives us examples saying things like, love means you don't neglect hospitality to strangers. Love means you don't forget to be there when people are in prison. Now we have to remember, put everything in context here. You got to remember the culture back then. If a Christian brother or sister is visiting this town, he's relying on that Christian church. He's relying on that family to help him, to be there for him christians were being persecuted back then now don't let me don't take that that they're not being persecuted today just because we're sitting in a nice church by the way but christians were being persecuted back then they were in the jails christians were in the jails they were in the prison so he's saying don't forget to love them don't forget to visit them don't forget to support them you are all family now i personally want to take this farther i want to expand on this i think in our world today that Christian love must, it desperately needs to go outside of these doors and outside of these walls. If you look on our back wall, as big as possible, it says we are, our, our point, the reason we're here, it says worship God, and then what does it say, do you remember? Love others, it says it right in front of me. So let me plead with you today. Let me appeal to you today that those people outside of these walls, those people who live around you those people who were in the cubicle next to yours at work they desperately need to see your christian love they desperately need to see my christian love and i can't help but ask the question when did we when did the church start thinking that non-christians around us have a sin disease that we can catch oh like it's a cold like it's a flu when do we start thinking that we're better than them? We're not, by the way. We're just saved. We're just forgiven. Saved sinners, as I like to say. So sadly, or some Christians, we, had, we begin to adopt an attitude, not of loving others like we see throughout the Bible, but we begin to adopt an attitude of separating ourselves. Up in the attitude that we can't hang out with them anymore. And the worst part of this mentality that we see throughout churches today is that's the complete opposite of what we find in the scripture. It's the complete backwards of what we see taught in the Bible. How many times do we see the disciples witnessing to Christians in the Bible? Throughout the Bible, how many times do you see the Christians in the church? Now, they are, of course, they do worship together, but compare that number with how many times you see them in the city talking, sharing the gospel. 
Some of us, we may have to boycott Jesus today. I could be wrong. Maybe we have to boycott Jesus today because last time I checked, he's hanging out with sinners. He's hanging out with the prostitutes. I've heard one, one theologian once said that Jesus wouldn't fit the qualification to teach Sunday school in the average church today. Scary stuff, isn't it? So not only are we to love our brothers and sisters who surround you today, but we are also to show this Christian love in our world. And listen, I get it. I've heard the phrase. I've seen it in the scripture. We are in this world, but not of this world. But the other side to that is we're all about impacting this world for Jesus Christ. And how well can I, how well can we impact someone that I don't even talk to? I'm a firm believer in missional living. I've spent a lot of time reading about that topic. And missional living, living basically means you're a missionary wherever you go. At work, at school, in line at the grocery store, no matter where you go, you are a missionary. The next, so let me encourage you, the next time you are in Starbucks, you got your six, seven, you know, you probably need more than a $5 bill, you don't go to Starbucks. But the next time you're in Starbucks, the person who serves you, I don't like using the word barista, barista whatever, what is it? Barista, yeah, I won't use that word. But, but the next time the person who serves you gives you a drink, get to know his name, get to know her name. Build a relationship with them. So you start praying for that person. Get to know them constantly. Missional living means we're constantly looking for ways for those people who are around us to get into their lives. And once again, let me plead with you for a moment. Don't retreat. It's so easy. I do this probably more than you all do. Don't retreat back into your safe homes don't back fall back into your comfort zone that's not the life we're called to live you're called to love those around you dc talk you remember the old christian band was it say love is a verb i think it taught that song sang that song we are called to be a missionary and you personally you personally can show the love of jesus christ to someone or maybe more people that no one else in this room can we are called to love our brothers we're called to love our sisters. And secondly, this morning, we are called to honor. It says in verse 4, honor marriage. Verse 4 says marriage is to be held in honor among all. And the marriage bed is to be undefiled for fornicators and adulterers. God will judge. He jumps. Keep in mind, he's jumping around. He jumps to the topic of marriage. And we must remember that the marriage institution was created by God himself. No matter what laws are passed, no matter what skeptics may say, no matter what other people may do to try to redefine Marriage, in the eyes of God, is a mar marriage is a man and a woman who become one flesh. Max Lucado, famous author, once said, God created marriage. No government subcommittee envisioned it. No social organization developed it. Marriage was conceived and born in the mind of God. Amen. Did you know that marriage, God created marriage as a comparison, as an example of our relationship with him. Marriage is a metaphor. Marriage is a symbol. It's a walking and living and breathing object lesson. An object lesson of how much God loves us. Ephesians chapter 5 talks all about this great topic. And there's no other relationship on the planet. Not even the relationship between a mother and a child. We all know how precious that is. No other relationship between a husband and a wife can adequately illustrate our relationship between God and us. It's one reason why man, marriage can't be redefined. This is why it must be protected at all costs, because we are the body of Christ. We are the bride of Christ. And you know, ultimately, it doesn't matter what I think about marriage, does it? Ultimately, it doesn't matter what public opinion says. It doesn't matter what's politically correct or incorrect. All that matters is what God says. All that matters is what God thinks, and he's the one who invented marriage, so we must honor it. We must actively protect it. We must guard it. Not just our own marriages, by the way, but marriage as a whole. Our passage says the marriage bed is to be undefiled. It's not a word that we all use much, is it? Undefiled. What does the word undefiled mean? What it means is something that's pure. It's something that's wholesome. It's something that's without any stain or blemish. No fault at all the marriage bed was created sex if you want to use it sex was created for a married couple to enjoy and our passage says anything else and it says adulterers fornicators it says we'll be judged by not me i can't judge you well i can but it doesn't matter let's be honest 
He's judged by God. That's serious stuff right there. You know, almost every book in the New Testament talks about sex. Because back in the first century, things were, if you may not even believe it, but things were as bad then as they are now. The apostles, the disciples, they were living in a time when sexual purity meant nothing to the average person. Adultery, prostitution, homosexuality, beyond whatever you want to say there. They were condoned as well as encouraged as they worshipped their pagan gods and their emperors. And so when Christians who maintain sexual purity, they really stood out, didn't they? And they stood out to the point where they were being mocked, where they were being ridiculed, for being obedient to God. Something that may sound familiar to some of our teenagers in today's public school. Many people think God has a negative view on sex. That's really not true at all. It's something that draws a man and a woman together. A beautiful bond of intimacy. But there's just one crucial qualification. It's to be enjoyed between a man and a woman who are in holy matrimony. Till death do us part. The author of Hebrews here, he's asking us as Christians to think countercultural. Not to go along with the flow our culture gives us, but to think from a Christian standpoint because marriage is a direct reflection of our Christian witness. So even though 60% of marriages are collapsing in our world today, even though every year we see middle schoolers getting pregnant, even though here in this room people have been affected by divorce, the pains of divorce, all these statistics, all these points show us is that we must press on. All it shows is that we must protect marriage the best way we can, as well as its true meaning. We are called to love our brothers. We are called to love our sisters. We are called to guard our marriages. And finally this morning, he jumps again and says we are to be careful with our money. Now let me ask you this question. Which one of these questions do we say more? Do I say more? Do we say how much of money, my money should I use for God? Or do we say, how much of God's money should I use for myself? If money could talk, where would it say it has been? There's a funny story about a $1 bill that met a $50 bill. And the um, $1 bill says, hey, buddy, I haven't seen you around here. Where you been? And so the $50 bill is talking and says, oh, I spent some time at the casinos. I went to the lottery. I got taken on a cruise ship. It was great. I went all around the ship. It was awesome. I ended up back in the United States. Went to a few pro football games, basketball games. Uh, went all over the place. Went to the mall with some teenagers. It's great. So he says, well, well, where have you been? Talking to the $1 bill. And the $1 bill just looked down, shook his head, and said, you know, the same old place. Church, church, and church. The author challenges us with stories like this, saying, do not fall in love with money. And, and you've got to remember back then, most of these Christians, they're not living in the palace, are they? They don't have servants worshiping them with palm branches. They're already the, they're the lower class. They're scraping for every penny to buy food for themselves and for their family. They barely had anything at all. They were being persecuted. And still... He reminds them. Still, he reminds us. Do not fall in love with your money. Don't don't fall in love with your possessions. Don't fall in love with the stuff you have. Jesus says in Matthew 6, 19 to 21, Jesus is talking and says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and vermin destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there is your heart will be also. And maybe the problem we have here, maybe from, it's just me, is that we don't realize that all we have is from God to begin with. Maybe that's the point we need to start with. We need to realize, especially when it comes to this area of life, there's nothing be here between the sacred and the secular. Bodhi Bakum once said a great quote. He says, no amount of money, no amount of toys can replace a godly father. Great quote. So a lot of preachers will, when talking about money, you know, the easy topic to talk about, right? They try to make rich people feel guilty. They try to make people who are wealthy feel bad about themselves because they actually have something. And then the best time, the perfect time to say, well, now, now it's the time for the offering, right? 
But I'm curious, as I, as I study, as I read, where did they learn that wealth is wrong? Where, where does it say in here that wealth is wrong? You see, wealth itself is not wrong. The problem that people face, the problem is when we begin to put our wealth up here and God somehow moves down here. When our stuff, our new car, our new house, which is great, by the way, is from God, it ends up here when God in our worship and adoration of him somehow gets pushed to the bottom of the pile. That's the problem. It's not the stuff. It's our mentality. You see, we should do everything for the glory of God. That means we are hard workers, right? That means we do the best we can to provide for our kids, to provide for our spouse, to provide for our family. We should be the kind of worker, we should be the employee that everyone else in the company says, he, she's a hard worker. That's how I want, I want everybody in my company to be like that guy, that lady. We should be the example of hard workers. And if wealth comes from that, God, great, that's great. But the problem is when you start thinking we are to strive for money. You see, we don't strive for money. Do you hear me? We don't strive for money. But you know what we strive for? We strive for Jesus Christ. In conclusion, we're called to love our brothers and sisters. We are called called to guard our marriage. We are called to be careful with our money. Paul is encouraging Timothy and hits almost on the same exact topic. 1 Timothy 6, 6 through 10, it says this. It says, but godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. People who want to get rich fall into temptation. And they trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money, it doesn't say money by the way, the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. This morning, to kind of take all of this and pull it together, the more I think about it, the more we think about it, this morning is all about love in action. How much do we love those around us? Do we love them enough to pray for them? Do we love them enough to show that we care and to take that extra step in their life? How much do we love our spouse? Do we love them enough to pray for them? Do we love them enough to put them above ourselves? How much do we love our money? And is our pursuit of money, is our pursuit of stuff stronger than our pursuit of godliness and holiness? And then lastly, above all, how much do we love our Savior? How much do we love our Creator, our Redeemer, and the King of all kings? Let us pray. Father, this morning, as we've hit on this various amount of topics, Father, kind of coming from all different angles, Father, I just pray somewhere in my ramblings that hearts have been stirred, that you have worked, Father. I pray as we think of these three areas of life that you will convict us, that you will call us back into being the men and the women that we are called to be, Father. I pray if there's someone here who says, I I don't know about this Jesus, I don't know him, I pray today will be the day of salvation. Today will be the day when questions are answered. Today will be the day when lives are changed. Today will be the day when sins, when bad habits, when things that have been trapping us for years are finally not just laid down, but thrown down at the cross, Father. Never, ever, ever to be picked up again. So many of us know exactly what it's like to lay it at the cross, to go back the next day. To lay it at the cross and say, I'm done with you, to go back three, four days later to wallow again. Help us as we continue to be examples of your love through our words, through our actions, through everything we do, Father. We love you. We praise you. We can't praise you enough for what you've done for us. It's in your beautiful and holy name that we pray. Amen.